Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Today's lecture will be devoted to uh, discoveries of Nithya, and we started this uh, topic uh, last lecture, and then we switch to accelerators and discoveries uh, using accelerator beams. So neutrino, neutrinos have been discovered uh, using beams from atomic reactors, which are enormous sources of neutrinos. You saw that there are more than 10 to the 20 neutrinos per second emitted by reactors, and even order of magnitude bigger if one employs the biggest uh, atomic reactors. The second important development which led to discovery neutrino is creation of big detectors. Remember that uh, in the early epoch of particle discoveries, the detectors were of small size. So now creation of a large mass detector and the number of events is proportional to the mass of the detector uh, opened the possibility to discover neutrino. So let me uh, say a few words about so-called scintillator detectors. As this type of the detector has been used uh, to discover neutrino, but also this is very common uh, detector type uh, in the present day uh, studies. So let me say a few words. There are some organic and also non-organic molecules, big one, with content Cm. This is carbon, hydrogen, M. And one example is, for instance, C14H10, which is benzene. And they have very interesting properties. I don't know, frankly, how that was discovered. Most probably it's just by empirically. These big molecules, heated by high energy particle, for instance, gamma, and gamma in MeV or even bigger energies, 10 MeV energies, they are not destroyed. Although really connection of energy, uh, bounding energy is quite small, but because of big, they can absorb big energy of incoming particles and being excited, and then they, they, uh, they uh, uh, make the excitation. But emission of many photons of lower energy. So these photons are determined by energy levels of atoms and molecules of this type. So, the procedure is that high energy particle excite this molecular, then the excitation occurs, and these photons in the final state, they have typically a range in keV. That is, they are in ultraviolet or even maybe of, uh, of uh, uh, lower frequencies. So, this is the light which produces very efficiently photo effect. That is, effect when photons knock the surface of. Uh, of somebody and then knock out uh, uh, the electrons from this surface. So, then detection of this light of secondary gamma by photo effect and so called photomultipliers, PMT which actually used this uh, uh, photo effect. So to say uh, we deal with the following scheme, when high energy particle in MeV or even 10 MeV scale, it hits 
of these molecules, which then re-emit in ultraviolet range, and this is detected by photo effect. So, how it is done? You have some volume of the detector, filled in by scintillator, then particle enters, high energy particle enters this volume, heats molecular, which then re-emits a secondary photons of lower energies. Imagine here is 10 MeVs, and this is key V, which is 3-4 orders of magnitude bigger. So you can treat this scheme as converter of uh, high energy of initial particles to low energy photons. It's like a converter. Now, at the surface of scintillator detector, experimentalists establish PMT. And let me explain. This is PMT. Which stands, on which stands for photomultiplier tubes. And uh, those photomultiplier tubes convert this uh, ultraviolet uh, photons into electric signal. Which then detected by, by, by the oscillator. So what is this photomultiplier? Again, this is extremely broadly used technique uh, in present experiments, so it's worthwhile to, to know this. So, this photomultiplier tube has got the following design, usually. So, this is kind of a bubble made of, of glass, so that, uh, that the photons can easily penetrate. Here, there is a cathode. And heating the cathode, Photons knock out electrons. Here, what the effect happens. Fine. But then the signal is enhanced in the following way. The anodes have the following design. So that that's a minus charge. Here is plus, 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 plus. But with increased potential. So. so that there is a difference of the potential between a cathode and the first anode, between the first anode and the second, the second, third, and third and fourth. So what happens is that here electrons appear they accelerate it in electric field, knock this plate, and produce, since they are accelerated, more electrons. Those again are accelerated and hit another anode. And in this way, the number of electrons increases. And so you will collect here quite big uh, the signal, electric signal, which can be seen. So, so to say, you see how it becomes more complicated technique of the detection? And now this particle which we are interested in, for instance, gamma of high energy, and then it produces second, secondary ultraviolet photons. Those produce photo effect. Then, due to this structure, this signal is enhanced. And then you see here the signal. Electric pulse. So 
So the point is that now you can have big volume filled in by scintillator. So you have more particles, big number of particles in the target, and uh, the probability of detection increases correspondingly. So that's, uh, that is uh, the um, photomultiplier uh, work. And by the way, I mentioned already uh, super Kamiakande and detection of uh, Cherenkov radiation. Cherenkov radiation is also in ultraviolet range, and therefore you can use the same devices also to detect Cherenkov radiation. And this is how super Kamiakande is uh, organized. Uh, this is a huge tank of water, though, uh, but the balls are covered by many photomultipliers, by thousands of photomultipliers. And they detect these ultraviolet photons from Cherenkov radiation. Here we deal photons which emerge from the scintillators. Okay? The questions? And in present day detectors, people are using these uh, scintillator techniques. It's not like a something which was uh, in the 50s when neutrino has been discovered. So extremely uh, widely spread technique in uh, particle physics. Now let's go to discovery of neutrino immediately. Neutrinos have been discovered by Frederick Reines and uh, Clyde Cohen. And in fact, they had experiment from 1953 to 1956, and they changed even the during these years. And final uh, statement of discovery was in 1956. The detector was near reactor at Savannah River. And this discovery, the inverse beta decay has been used were antineutrinos from reactors. And this is actually big luck. So the reactors are sources of antineutrinos. They heat protons. And in final state, we have neutron and positron. This reaction has actually energy threshold, which is 1.8. 8 MeV. So you had an exercise. However, just to simplify, uh, we ignore this threshold. That is, this reaction uh, start to be uh, uh, active when neutrino energy is bigger than 1.8 MeV. And this is because neutron is heavier than proton. And then we need also to produce electron, right? So you need to have energy, both to overcome mass difference here, and also produce electrons. So that's the threshold energy. The experiment was organized in such a way to detect both products of this reaction in final state. The scheme of the detector, the second one, which actually uh, produced results in 1956, was the following. As a target, Rhinus and Cohen used water, so let me, let me draw and then I will explain more, in more details.
there are two tanks filled in by water. So here we have water. And why do we use water? Because you want to have this process. You want to have essentially free protons. This reaction has a, has a high enough cross-section in comparison with other reactions. So this is water. And this is water. And these water tanks were surrounded by the tanks with scintillator. So here are scintillator detectors. They are surrounded by the scintillator detectors. Just to have some idea about the scale, the width of this water tank was seven centimeters. And this is not accidental again. Uh, it is small because one wants to have uh, neutron and positron going out. So if you have very wide this uh, tank or, or big thickness, then they can be absorbed already inside this, uh, these tanks. Now, this size is something like 0 0.6, 0 0.6 meters. And now the length here is 1.9 meters. And this dimension is 1.3 meters. Well, relatively big in comparison with uh, the, the first detectors, uh, but of course it's much smaller than what we have now. I will mention this also. So, how things proceed, the flux, so this detector was established not far from, from, from the uh, uh, core of the reactor. So this is important because we want to have as big as possible flux of neutrinos. So these neutrinos enter the detector and in water due to this reaction on protons produce neutrons and positrons. So neutrons and positrons. So what is what happens uh, and positrons? So what happens with these products? Positrons lose the energy and these positrons lose energy on ionization because for water this critical energy is something like 70 MeVs, much bigger than the energy of neutrinos from reactors. And remember, we had the spectrum and the, the energy, say, from 1 to 10 MeVs. These are, uh, this is energy range of neutrino, anti-neutrinos from atomic reactors. So positrons lose energy and annihilate With electrons in medium, so you have the process E plus, E minus, and two gammas in final state. And uh, how we can depict this process? This is electromagnetic process. What we have is the following say, electron, and this is positron. And this is positron. And we have two electromagnetic vertices. And in those vertices, photons are emitted. So this is second process in the electromagnetic interaction. We have this standard electromagnetic interaction twice. This process is very quick. Electron loses, uh, positron loses the energy and annihilates. And this is what uh, is called, they produce Prompt signal. So, electron or positron annihilates produces 
to gamma and this gamma in scintillator detector produce the signal which we have discussed before. So they are of high energies because neutrinos have MeV range and therefore these gammas which appear from annihilation are of high energies and in scintillator they are absorbed exciting molecules of scintillator and produce secondary ultraviolet uh, of photons which are detected by photomultipliers and photomultipliers surrounded uh, surrounded uh, the scintillator detector so I'll just schematically show uh, a three but they are from all the sides so that the photons which are produced ultraviolet photons have high probability to be detected so this signal is detected so what happens with Newton is more complicated Actually, this uh, target is not just uh, water. They add to the water cadmium salt. This is also a common element in the present day detectors. Why they did this? They did this because cadmium, quite heavy nuclei, has very high probability to capture neutrons. So that this neutron, also a relatively high, of high energy, it actually has many scatterings, it diffuse, then meet the nuclei cadmium. And what happens is that neutron plus cadmium, cadmium absorbs this neutron, turns out into, so this is the second phase, uh, second process, turns out to be excited, and then the excitation again produces many photons. So let's go to cadmium and a number of photons. Two, three, four. So we have here again first high energy photons, which again are absorbed by uh, molecules of scintillator, converted into low energy photons, which then detected by photomultiplier. This is second signal, which is called delayed signal, and delay essentially is related to this diffusion of neutron before it actually captured by cadmium. So two signals and what experimentalists saw finally two electric pulses. In monitoring they saw the following picture. So this is electric signal And this is time. First they saw the pulse related to positron annihilation. So positron pulse. And then with delay, they saw bigger pulse due to neutron absorption of cadmium. Typical time difference in these two pulses is 10 microseconds. Again, this is related to the average time of diffusion of neutron before it is captured. So, delta T, say 10 microseconds, typical energy release is in the range, say, 3 to 10 MeVs and we have these two pulses and what is important also that these scintillator detectors they do not give information about say direction of particle moves they do not produce the drugs right but what they see they see energy release they are very efficient in detection of energy release inside the detector 
So, but even this information is, uh, is enough to make uh, many important studies. So, this is expected picture with these parameters, and this is very important to what? To really be convinced that what we see is the neutrino signal, and what is important to distinguish from background. So that allows efficiently distinguish from background. And of course you have background, just they continuously observe some electric pulses. This is because of radiation, because of some other charged particles which enter the detector and also produce this effect. And of course there are some small chance that you have two particles entering the detector with this interval. And of course they made computations. This is a, 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 as usual. So, what is the probability that the background reproduce the same type of the effect, which means two signals, one is smaller, another is bigger, with this difference and with uh, total energy released in this range. And it turns out that the background, estimated background, was small, or much smaller than expected number of events. Horizon, so, um, Rhinus and Cohen have detected uh, this type of the events. And I think in the first rounds of the experiment there were several dozens of these events. Important thing also to be convinced that these are uh, neutrinos uh, was to compare the number of events observed with number of predicted events So you did this estimation. Also what is important that the number of uh, observed events equals, of course with error bars, to what is expected. Of course if you would see much more events, that clearly this is something which is not related to neutrinos. This is an interesting story. So, um, uh, they observed some number of events compared with what is expected and concluded that what they see uh, corresponds to what is expected. Few months later, there were new computations of number of events, theoretical computations, like you are doing also. And it was found that the number of events factor of two differs from what has been, has been estimated before. So theoreticians made error uh, by factor of two. And and soon Rhinus and Cohen said that, okay, so we have our uh, sigma which co is consistent with, with this new theoretical prediction. People are saying that that may be the problem for Rhinus to get, no to get Nobel Prize. So he got Nobel Prize in 1995, 1995, very late. Remember the discovery is 56. And even people who discovered the second neutrino, muon neutrino, got the Nobel Prize before. Well, the question is why, why, why Rhinus, who actually discovered the first neutrino, didn't got Nobel Prize so, so uh, early? Well, that's what people are saying. Nobody knows that. So eventually, the uh, Nobel Committee will disclose what, what, what was discussion and uh, justification, but uh, that will take still some time. I think 50 years, right? So from 95, 50 years, or well, 30 years, I don't remember already. Exactly. Questions? 
You see how rich physics already here in this discovery, how many different effects are involved in this discovery, in different processes. Questions? Clear? So let me say a few words why I'm discussing this in some details still. I'm discussing this because the story of uh, studies of antineutrinos from reactors continues and will continue. And maybe some of you will work on something related to this. Let me briefly mention, I'm, I will have some lectures on neutrinos in the end of the course. I may again come back to this. So after these discoveries, there were, during all these years till now, big number of experiments with reactor neutrinos. And now actually the number of events detected are hundreds of thousands of events. It's not just rare. People were first estimated that uh, neutrinos will be never discovered, but now we have you know, a huge number of events. So what happened? In the 80s and 90s of last century, there was a series of the experiments to study, for instance, neutrino electron scattering and not only neutrino proton scattering, what we have described. So that cross section is much smaller. Then one of the goals was uh, uh, searches for neutrino oscillation. which is the process of conversion of one neutrino species into another one. So in the uh, Rhinus time, people didn't know that uh, there are several neutrino species. So, and they can actually convert one into another, just in empty space, propagating an empty space. And that was uh, one of the goals of these experiments. And let me mention some of them. Uh, so experiments are in Gersgen. Some results actually still are uh, used for this Gensgen, Bouget, then Rodno, this is in, in Russia, Krasnoyarsk also. Then a bit later, the, the various uh, experiments like Shoes and Paolo Verde. Next was Kamland experiment. Kamland experiment in Japan. And this experiment actually detected signal from many reactors. All reactors in, in, in Japan essentially, and even some reactors in, from Korea, in Korea. And the goal was to again search for uh, neutrino oscillations. And what they have discovered, this was one of the important discoveries in particle physics, they discovered neutrino oscillations. So that was discovery. Neutrino oscillations with uh, lengths of oscillations, more than 100 kilometers, the average distance between the detector and uh, the and, uh, and the atomic reactors were something like 180 kilometers. So they discovered oscillations driven to so-called one-two mass splitting. So we have now three neutrinos and therefore three mass states, one, two, and three, and so what they measured, they measured oscillations due to mass difference between state 1 and state 2. I will have lectures on neutrino oscillations later, so I will, I will explain this. This is kind of second phase, then the third series of experiments to search for so-called 1-3 mixing. 
mixing associated with, with these states and also mass difference. So there were several experiments, like double shoes. This is update of this early uh, shoes experiment in France. Chinese experiment, Diabei. And Korean experiment, Reno. And those experiments are still produced data. So they have discovered one three mixing. So the highest uh, statistics experiment, the more precise determination was done by Diabay experiment. So it's discovery of one three mixing. So this is not the end of the story. Because there are experiments, particularly planned to search for sterile neutrinos. So nowadays we know that there are three neutrinos. And some data indicate that maybe there are some other neutrino species which even have no weak interaction. So our neutrinos have weak interactions, what we have discussed, described by G. Fermi. But also there are some kind of data which probably indicate that maybe there are some additional species of, uh, of, uh, of neutrinos and it, there, was, there is some very wide program of searches for sterile neutrinos. So sterile neutrinos, this term has been introduced by Bruno Ponte Corvo. And we have again a series of the experiments like stereo, like NEOS, that's in Korea, dance in Russia, and also neutrino 4 in, in Russia. So those experiments have the main goal to search for sterile neutrinos. And actually, there's a specific program in the United States, in Fermilab, but they will not use um, reactor neutrinos. They will use B uh, from, from, uh, from accelerators in, in Fermilab, again, to search for sterile neutrinos. And finally, what is under development is Juno experiment. Juno experiment, and this experiment have 20 kiloton scintillator. Imagine we started with some small kilogram scale detector, then it was one ton detector. And this is the detector with the mass 20 kilotons. So it's 20 times 10 to the 3 tons. Which is not a joke, right? So you see how scale changed during these years. And the main goal of this experiment is to establish mass hierarchy of neutrino. Or mass ordering, more precisely, mass ordering. So this is Chinese experiment. Actually, a big uh, international collaboration is involved, of course. Uh, so this experiment is under development and they may start already in maybe two, three years of, of oper to operate. So what is this mass hierarchy? You may have spectrum like this, when you have small split between one and two states and big one between uh, uh, one and three, or it may be like this. This is what we call inverted ordering. Still we don't know what is pre exact what is exact uh, ordering of neutrino masses, which is, has important implications for the theory. And Juno is uh, the experiment, reactor experiment, which is aimed at establish neutrino mass hierarchy. Questions? So, we have electron neutrino, what we discussed, which appears in beta decay. This 
neutrino has interactions with usual matter, right? So this neutrino can be transformed into electron and uh, interact with, with, uh, with proton and neutron, right? So it also appears in, in muon decay, this pair, and therefore this neutrino has interaction which is described by Fermi coupling constant, right? This is what we have discussed. Now, sterile neutrinos have no such interactions. They do not convert it to any charged lepton. So sterile means that they have no interaction. They just can, uh, they have much more strong penetration uh, 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 abilities. Though, it's not completely true that they are, have no absolute interaction. They mix with, uh, with electron neutrinos and with muon neutrinos and tau. So that we will discuss later. So this is the neutrinos which have no usual weak interactions described by Fermi coupling constant. Now this is one of the important uh, branches of developments of particle physics in these years. This is why I'm um, discussing this in, in some details. More questions? So you see, here the source of neutrinos are not cosmic rays already. So we kind of already switched from cosmic ray discoveries to, to something which is artificially produced. So these neutrino fluxes are produced artificially. Okay. So now we are starting a new topic. accelerators and discoveries in accelerator experiments. Well, let me first discuss how we accelerate particles. accelerate charged particles. And to accelerate charged particles, we are using electric fields, right? So acceleration of charged particles. In electric field. Usually when people are discussing accelerator experiments and accelerators, they are talking about magnetic field. So what is magnetic field of LHC, what is it? But not much about electric field. So we are not accelerating by magnetic fields. Remember this. Magnetic field bend your trajectory, but not accelerate particle. So we need to apply electric field which produces the force E and then this is the strength of electric field and this is E D, D, gradient of potential so it's gradient of potential not potential, electric potential but the difference of the potentials which produces electric field and accelerate particles so the idea is that you have potentials. So in one point is V1, and another point is V2, as a function of x. And what when particle propagates from this point to that one, it accelerates. So you need to have difference of the potentials. Remember this, that's, that's important. So the energy which particle acquires, uh, so yeah. So this is energy of the field, strength of the field. Unfortunately, 
it's common to use the same, the same letter. The energy acquired by particle is given by the charge multiplied by the difference of the potentials. Now, usually, we want to create more and more powerful accelerators. So why? So we want to accelerate particles to higher and higher energies. This is, from one hand side, is because we want to discover something new. And the idea is that we haven't seen the part some particles because they are too heavy. Now there is kind of change of paradigm. But anyway, so the, the main tendency is that there is some new physics, some new particles, which have big mass, and we do not see them, uh, see them because uh, we have too small energies of our accelerators to produce. And to produce some new particle with a given mass, you need to have energies of collision, so we will discuss this energy in the center of mass of collision, which is bigger than the mass of a given particle. So this is why we want to have higher and higher uh, energies of uh, of accelerated particles. So how to get higher energies? To have higher energies, we need to have bigger gradient of potential. So what happens, however, if you have very big gradient of the potential, bigger than 10 MeVs over meter, you will have discharges. Even if you have a very evacuated medium, you will have discharges because of still presence of some particles in your cavity where you apply this potential, or just because some particles are ejected from the surfaces, from the walls of your detector, from cathodes that are not, as we saw already from Thomson experiment, right? So. Uh, that produces discharges and that restricts the energy till which we can accelerate charged particles. So, how we overcome this, uh, this restriction? We overcome this restriction using idea to use small enough delta V so that you have no discharges, but many times. So that the total difference of the potentials is N multiplied by delta V, and N can be big, or very big, and therefore we can get very big total uh, difference of the potentials and consequently uh, accelerate particles to high energies. There are two realizations of, of this idea. One is to we use many different delta V so that you have different regions with small delta V but many regions. And this is realized in so-called linear accelerators. Another idea is to use the same delta V, but many times. So, you have in some space delta V, particle crosses this space, accelerates, but then you bend your particle trajectory and it again goes through the same region with delta V, and accelerates again and again and again. So this is the idea of uh, a cyclic accelerators. So this is cyclic accelerators.
and in particular synchrotrons. So that's realized in synchrotron. So let me first describe Linux, linear accelerators. So this is the idea to use small different delta V. The main components of Linux, linear accelerators, are the following. So I will try to, to draw this and, uh, and put here what are these components. First is the pipe and which particles move and accelerate. Pipe is very up high vacuum, so strongly evacuated. The second is drift tubes or cavities or clistrons. Let me show you and then I will comment. So this is pipe. And it can be many of these cavities, thousand cavities, in big accelerators. That's uh, or sometimes people are calling these deep cubes. There's electric tension which is applied to these tubes in alternative way. So this tube is connected with this tube, this one is connected with this one, and here alternative electric power is uh, applied. So it's alternative voltage is applied here. So that, for instance, if this has minus sign, this plus, this minus, this plus. So alternatively. So these are have minus charges, these are plus charges. And this changes with time. Important component of existence of gaps. So we have gap here between the clistrons, between the uh, between the uh, the cavities. So gaps are here. And acceleration occurs precisely in these gaps. So the cavity is made of metallic material, so they are conductors. And therefore, all the cavity has the same potential. So in a given cavity, in a given moment of time, 
potential is everywhere the same. So there is no difference of the potentials inside the cavity, so along the cavity. And the difference of the potentials is in the gap. So we have this alternative voltage, uh, voltage with actually a radio frequency, which is not accidental. Radio frequency. So what is the physics of acceleration? Well, actually, actually, the point is that here are of smaller size, then uh, these cavities increase, and they are then eventually of, of, of practically the same size. So, in the initial part, it's a uh, it's, uh, it's smaller size. The crucial point that acceleration uh, uh, proceeds using the bunches of particles. So here we have injection, not just continuous flux of uh, particles, for instance, electrons, but particles in this kind of small packages, which we call bunches. It is not possible to have acceleration of uh, continuous flux, because some parts of the flux will be accelerated, some decelerated. So that's a crucial point. Bunches of particles, and alternative voltage. So, let me now show the picture of how acceleration occurs. And let me put here D, or time, you can do this. And then let me just depict the gaps. So these are gaps. And here I put um, energy accelerate of accelerated beam of bunches. So these are our cavities. Sorry, uh, uh, gaps between cavities, and here are cavities here, and these are gaps. So suppose we have electron which is uh, moving inside uh, the, 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 the first cavity. When it enters the gap, it will feel the difference of the potentials, minus here and plus here, so the difference of the potentials, and therefore it will be accelerated. So, um, in the first gap, so we have the potential of this type. So actually, it's alternative and that will be like, um, like this, something like this. This is, this is the potential change periodically. So, electron crosses the first gap when potential is in this increase. So, that's plus, plus, this is a minus, minus, and so it feels uh, the potential which will accelerate this. Okay, so accelerated electron now appears in the second cavity. If you would have just constant electric tension, not alternating, then this electron will reach the second cavity, se second gap and it will find a wrong change of the, of the field. So it will be minus here and plus here, and then it will be decelerated in the second cavity. Right? So if you have constant electric tension, which doesn't change, then in one gap you will have acceleration, and another one deceleration. Now, the trick is the following. 
while the particle is moving in this first, so in this uh, after the gap in, in this in this cavity, you switch polarity, so that this becomes minus and this becomes plus, and therefore electron when it reaches the second gap will again feel the change of the potential from minus to plus and therefore it will accelerate again now the question what happens when so electron moves inside the cavity and you change the polarity what happens with electron why it doesn't decelerate so you see this is the right change of, uh, of uh, potential, which leads to acceleration. Now, while particle moves in the cavity, you change the polarity in such a way that when you uh, reach the next gap, you will have again from minus to plus. But when it moves inside the cavity, you change potential. So how this affects say electron, we are talking about electron, just for, for definiteness. You understand the question? Electron moves within the cavity and you change the polarity. How this affects electron? You see, this is good direction, this is bad, so why we have no deceleration in the cavity? So why, since we have alternative electric tension. Actually, I mentioned already so the, the answer to some extent to, to, this, to this question before. Yeah. So what is the answer? Is electron affected or not? And you see, this is what I want to still you to appreciate. Things are simple when you already know this, you know. <laughs> so, but but every step, even simple step, may turn out to be non-trivial. So of course, if when you are you know, reading textbooks, okay, that's clear. This is trivial. You say, okay, that, that's, of course it's clear. I mean, it, it's trivial <laughs> what happens, of course. So the answer is nothing happens. And electron will not feel the change of polarity. Why? Because, again, what is important is difference of the potentials. And if you change the potential of all the cavity simultaneously, then it will be no difference of the potentials. So you are cheating your electron. So why, one, once he is moving here, it accelerates because it's from minus to plus. Here you change polarity, but the electron doesn't feel it. Clear, right? So you change polarity in the same way. Again, what is important for acceleration is a difference of the potential. dV or dx, gradient of potential. If you change, if you have some region and change the potential in all this region in the same way, then you do not produce electric field in this way. And therefore, electron which is moving in this region will not feel any force. It will not be accelerated, of course, but also it will not be decelerated. So, and when it arrives to the second cavity, it meets again the sign of the force or the sign of the potential in the right way. So it has from minus to plus. It accelerates, then it moves in the next cavity 
it doesn't feel any change of the field when it arrives at the third gap, it again meets correct sign of the change of the potential and therefore it will accelerate again. So uh, the energy of a lepton then will change in the following way. So a lepton comes, it accelerates here, the energy increases in this gap. Nothing changes when a lepton propagates within the gap. Then in this gap, it again increases the energy. Then nothing happens in the uh, third cavity. And then it will be again acceleration and again stop. So it will be kind of ladder of this type, right? So this is the energy of electron. It doesn't change inside the cavities. And it increases in the gaps between cavities. Clear? So why do we use radio frequency? In the early day accelerators, usually the frequency around, say, 30 megahertz was used, which is uh, 3, say, 10 to the 7 hertz. This frequency corresponds to lambda, the wavelengths, equals C over frequency. And that will be around 10 meters. So this is typical size of devices we are using. So this is typical size of these cavities. And since electrons are propagating with velocity of the, uh, of the order of uh, velocity of light, then our cavities should have the same size to have this kind of adjustment. By the way, remember I mentioned that the first cavities have smaller lengths and then they become bigger, bigger, and then nothing changes. And this is because you first accelerate particles. So it's still not moving with velocity of light, so it moves slower than later. And therefore the first cavities are of smaller size, but then uh, since acceleration occurs, velocity increases, the size of the cavity becomes bigger. And then when velocity uh, will be of the order of velocity of light, the size of the cavities will be the same. Well, actually, uh, in LHC, uh, people are using uh, the higher uh, frequencies and therefore the sizes of, uh, of these cavities are, are smaller. So one of the examples of the famous linear accelerator is a slack. And we will discuss a number of discoveries uh, made using this linear accelerator. So this is uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator. In California. So let me give you some examples. The length of this pipe surrounded by uh, cavities is two kilometers. It's not a joke, right? And they have 240 plistrons or cavities. So you can estimate what is the size of each of these or drift tubes. This accelerator uh, accelerates particles up to the maximum energies um, 25. 30 GeVs. So 1 GeV is the mass of the proton. And we will uh, discuss a number of discoveries made uh, at SLAC using this accelerator. So, people now dis are discussing this time uh, new linear accelerator, so international linear collider with uh, energies which will be around 500 GeVs. Now, what are applications of these uh, linear accelerators? 
They usually used for fixed target experiment. So you have target, you accelerate protons, oh sorry, uh, electrons or protons, you also can use this for protons, and then hit the target, and then study what are results of interactions. Linear accelerators are under use always as pre-accelerators. Practically in all present day uh, configurations of accelerators. So this is kind of the first phase of acceleration. So uh, modern accelerator complexes are really very sophisticated and you have even several steps of acceleration. The first step is usually this linear accelerator which starts to accelerate, then accelerated particles are injected in more powerful accelerators. And in synchrotrons, all the synchrotrons which we are using, they have pre-accelerators and this linear accelerator as pre-accelerators. Also, we can organize collider using uh, 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 linear accelerator. So colliders, when you accelerate, both colliding particles. LHC is collider. So how we do this? So we have actually two pipes, and now uh, this is configuration of slack experiment. Slack actually is collider based on linear acceleration. So there are two pipes inside the cavities, and I will eventually send you the slides so you will see these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, devices in detail. So you have the ca two cavities. In one you have electrons, and in another posit and so, uh, positrons and electrons. Of course, acceleration again occurs in these bunches because you need to have this bunch which is, has a smaller size than the gap, right? Otherwise, you will have no acceleration. And so you can uh, use the same cavities, the same electric system, but just to have bunches with some, some delay so that for electrons, one uh, 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 time kind of uh, 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 injection is correct for positrons, a uh, different one. And so you can accelerate both electrons and positrons inside the same system of cavities. In the end, you use magnetic field and, this, uh, and direct your elect positrons in this way, and electrons in this way, and then organize the range when these two beams are colliding. So this is what is called storage ring. So here you use magnetic field, accelerate particles, inject into the storage ring, and then they start to rotate. So positrons in one direction, electrons in other direction. Here you have two tubes. However, in one of the positions you organize intersection of these tubes or pipes in which electrons and positrons are storaged. And here you put the detector and then study uh, results of uh, collisions of electrons and positrons. Again, so this is how slack accelerator is, is organized. Now let me discuss cyclic accelerators. Oh, questions?
Here, the idea is to use the same delta V many times. So, for this you need to bend the trajectory so that your particle uh, can pass through the same gap um, many times. The idea is the following, the simplest one, because we now use it much more sophisticated, but that was configuration of one of the first series of, uh, of these cyclic accelerators. So, you have magnetic field, of course, you need to have this to bend the trajectory. This is the gap. Well, of course, the idea is the same, so electric field accelerates. Actually, here you have two gaps. Right? So, here, so suppose you have plus here and minus here. And you have particle which is moving in this gap, or electron, so it accelerates. Here, it has bigger energy. Now, it turns in the magnetic field. When it reaches again the same gap, after this turning, you switch again the polarity, so it will be uh, here minus, it will be plus. It will accelerate again. It moves again after acceleration and what happens is that since the momentum increases the radius increases and this is our Larmor formula which actually describes this and uh, uh, the radius of trajectory is given by momentum electric charge and magnetic field so in this configuration B is constant and therefore, when acceleration occurs, the radius becomes bigger. So, you see here the radius is uh, quite small then. After acceleration it becomes bigger. After further acceleration it becomes even bigger. And you will have this kind of spiral motion. And then eventually you put out of your body. So these are cyclotrons when B is constant, but radius of trajectory increases in the course of acceleration. So this is gap. And, and this is gap, sorry where acceleration occurs. Another idea is to use synchrotrons. In the synchrotrons, radius is constant, Magnetic field changes. It changes in such a way to keep the trajectory with the same radius. So we can write this formula in the following way. Momentum as a function of T equals E the radius B as a function of T. This is again the same Larmor formula. Uh, what happens? You accelerate particle, momentum of particle increases, and you need to increase correspondingly the magnetic field. So to say, synchronize the change of momentum of particle or energy of particle and the change of magnetic field. So you need to have synchronization of the heat. And radius is the same, radius is constant. So how it is realized? Again, you have circular pipe
and this magnetic field, which bends the trajectory, and particle moves in this pipe. And then in some places of your circle, you put essentially linear accelerators, which uh, accelerate particles. Still you need to have a cap, still you need to have electric field somewhere where acceleration occurs. But what happens, you do not change the radius of trajectory. This is fixed. This is like LHC is working. So you have the tunnel, you have these pipes inside the tunnel. This doesn't change. But what changes is magnetic field. And also, actually this is not exactly circle. Uh, what happens in, in this big modern accelerator, so the trajectory is like this. So there are some places when you have magnetic field, many places where trajectory bends, and some places where you have acceleration. That's how it uh, works these days. Now let me uh, describe uh, properties of features of this acceleration, of synchrotrons. So actually the, the work of synchrotrons, or modern accelerators, is the following. First you make injection of particles in your pipe. You perform acceleration. Sometimes, for instance, at, L at LHC it may take some, you know, hour. I will give you uh, uh, later the, the, the numbers. And then acceleration stops and your particles are rotating in, inside, the, inside, the, uh, inside your pipe. And uh, there are some areas where you put detectors. And where collisions of particles occur. So to have a collider, you need to have two pipes, right? So uh, in one pipe, and particle moves in one direction, and another pipe in another direction. So in some points, they intersect. You put detector, you study interactions, and that occurs some hours. Uh, 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 but then beam of flux of the particles inside start to degrade. There are some collisions sometimes with walls, with some elements in, in, inside the pipe. And for instance, uh, uh, in, uh, at LHC, uh, several hours you have this uh, duty cycle. And then you need to clean your, your uh, pipe. There is a dump of the beam. And next day you start again. Inject particle, accelerate, then they are colliding, then you stop the things. You put out the beam, clean things, and then next day repeats again. So this is how it works. It works in a cycle. Now, as in the linear accelerators here, we deal with bunches. So first is synchronization, the second is bunches. And this is again related to the acceleration itself, because uh, you still need to put kind of a type of Linux in some are parts of the trajectory to make acceleration. So it's again needed to, to, to have a bunch acceleration. And I will show you parameters. Actually, you will have some even, even, even the problem to do this. So interesting point is, uh, there are some interesting points like uh, self-focusing with some interesting features. But what I want to discuss in the last uh, five minutes is a uh, very important effect in all these type of uh, cyclic accelerators and uh, this is uh, synchrotron radiation. Which is crucial for planning of uh, these uh, synchrotrons and uh, future experiments. And which gives actually a limitation of this map. So what is this? You have particle moving along the banded trajectory. So you have particle with charge E and the mass X 
and it has banded trajectory. So it accelerates, and therefore it emits photons. Similarly to what we had in the case of radiation energy loss, there we also had banded orbit which produces uh, eventually radiation. The difference is that here we have bending due to magnetic field and in radiation energy loss, what we have discussed before, the trajectory was bended by electric field, right? We have, for instance, nuclei and then the force is electric charge multiplied by the strength of the field. So there are different forces. Different dependence of forces on parameters, and I will show you this now. Different expressions for acceleration, which occurs here and there, and therefore different, finally, energy loss in these two cases. Let me write the formula for this energy loss. And probably I will write formula comment and then we'll have some more a deep explanation later. DE over DX on to synchrotron radiation can be written as 2 over 3 electric charge square this is clear because we have electromagnetic interactions one vertex here one complex and when you compute probabilities then it's square and then very important factor which I think you probably can remember which is momentum of particle and the force power the mass of the particle in the force power and the radius of orbit squared. There are several very important features of this formula. Remember, radiation energy loss was dE over dx was proportional to 1 over the mass of the particle square and say momentum or energy of the particle with some other coefficients. So, so before we had here energy or momentum of particle is relativistic over the mass square. Here we have momentum to the force power. So let me put here to better P over mx squared. So this is in electric field, and this is what we have here, momentum to the force power. So which means that the energy loss very fastly increases in the process of acceleration. And at some point it will lead to termination of acceleration, when energy loss will be comparable with gain of the energy. I will say a little bit more about this. Then, it is proportional to 1 over r squared. So, the bigger radius of your accelerator, the smaller energy loss. Now you are fighting against this radiation loss. And so, to reduce this, you need to have bigger and bigger accelerator. So already LHC has the radius, so circum, uh, uh, the, 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 the length of orbit is 27 kilometers, and now people are discussing uh, the accelerator's next generation of the size of 100 kilometers length, precisely to beat this energy loss, to reduce energy loss. And uh, the third important is that one over the mass of the particles to the force, so the energy loss is extremely big for light particles. Extremely big for light particles. And therefore, in this type of accelerator, it's better to accelerate heavy particles, protons, 
for nuclear and not electrons. I can tell you that this LHC accelerator was used first for lab experiment and, uh, and uh, the highest energy of electrons in this experiment was around 100 GeVs. That's already the limit almost when uh, 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 synchrotron energy loss becomes very big. Using the same tunnel, the same radius of the length of the orbit for protons, now we have acceleration up to 7 TeVs. 7 TeVs. Which is 70 times bigger. Because the energy loss for proton is much smaller. Now using this formula you can compute what is the energy loss over one rotation. And this delta E, one circle, is you just multiply this by 2 pi radius and what you will get is 2 over 3 energy square p to the force or here it will be it will be 4 pi 4 pi p to the force and x to the 4 and radius not radius square so this is energy loss over one third and of course, if this delta E becomes comparable with uh, energy which you are investing to the particle, so delta E acceleration, the acceleration will stop, essentially like this. And there is no sense to kind of to proceed with further acceleration, and because energy loss even increases faster. So next lecture, what I will, unfortunately I have no time to, to do this now, I will explain this dependence. Actually, one can explain this uh, using semi-classical consideration as we did also uh, before and I can show how these factors actually appear. Questions? Polarization. And polarity. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, the polarity. Mm -hmm. Yes. But we can do it with the component of the particle is in the polarity, so we can change the polarization. Uh, so say again. <laughs> Final part. So yeah, we change polarization when particle is, is in the in the inside the cavity. And yes. Oh, you, you just make computation. And so everything is actually, this is, this is what you planned before. Uh, because you know the time when you inject particle. So you have this, your pipe. And this is very non-trivial thing, I, I, I should say, right? So you, need, you, you have many bunches. And you need also to compute what should be the distance between these different bunches so that they are crossing the cavities in the uh, correct moment of time. So everything should be, should be synchronized. I mean, when you will know the parameters of, uh, of uh, LHC, that will be really as unbelievable for me, for theoretician, I, I, I cannot imagine, you know. It's 27 kilometer circumstance. And there are some places when you have acceleration. And then the size of the bunch is something like seven centimeters. And it's like the hair of, of, of person. And you need to control position of each of these bunches. And there are 2,000 bunches in your circle. Can you imagine? And then eventually you need to collide them in some place. 
If not this, you are not able to do, to, to do acceleration and perform experiments. This is really unbelievable. This is fantastic how they managed to do this, right? To match these uh, magnetic fields, uh, focusing, everything, timing. Otherwise, you will have a disaster. So your bunches start to randomly collide, and so the essential that you, you need to stop and then clean the experiment, clean the pipe, and etc. Yeah, so that's, that is computed, and you need really to have high accuracy time of injection of each bunch of, uh, of particles in your system. And remember also the sizes of uh, cavities are different just because you also know how fast, what is the acceleration in the first gap and therefore you have your size of the next cavity such that, since you know velocity, such that uh, your bunch will reappear in the next gap in the right moment of time. So everything is counted. So that's, everything should be counted. More questions? Okay, so if not, then uh, we stop today here, and I will probably later today send the second bunch of the exercises, and some of these uh, uh, problems are related to what we have discussed here, uh, the synchrotron energy loss and uh, connected topics. Okay? Okay, so thank you.